welcome to the News Minute. I am Dhanya Rajendran. Thank you for joining One More Conversation. This time we'll be talking about the Supreme Court of India and the Chief Justice of India who will be retiring. Joining me in this conversation is Professor G. Mohan Gopal, who was, is a former director of the National Law School of India. He was also director of the National Judicial Academy of the Supreme Court of India. There is a lot of criticism about how courts have been functioning, what is the role that they play in democracy, etc. And it's also crucial for us to look at what the CJI's role has been. Before we delve into this conversation, let me remind you, the News Minute and News Laundry are completely ad-free platforms that are dependent on you, the subscriber or the reader. So do subscribe to the News Minute and support our journalism. Thank you, Professor, for joining me on the News Minute. I want to start with a broad question and then we will sort of zoom into the details. How do you look at the legacy or the term of this uh, outgoing Chief Justice of India? I'd like to say that, uh, uh, you know, it's a, it's a mixed legacy. It's a mixed legacy. We've, we've had some very uh, important positive uh, judgments from him, uh, which have uh, said things that the Supreme Court should have said a long time ago on a number of complex issues. We've also had some very disappointing uh, judgment from him. So it's a very mixed legacy uh, that we have from certainly one of the most erudite uh, judges to have uh, been uh, occupying that office of uh, the Chief Justice of India. Expectations were very high. And I, 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 I unfortunately, I, I don't think uh, all those expectations have been met. Why do you believe so that the expectations have not been met? And you also said the expectations were high. So what do you believe were those expectations when he took charge? I think the, 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 the highest expectation we have of a judge uh, is that the judge will act independently according to the law. We all have all, all, you know, as many judges have written famously, judges are just ordinary flesh and blood humans who have their own life story and their own experience, predilections and prejudices. However, there is a methodology uh, of, uh, of, by, of reasoning, legal reasoning, which, uh, which, uh, which, is, which is a set of guardrails we have to control the decision making by judges. And uh, when you follow that, then it, it doesn't entirely eliminate, but it mitigates the, the personal element and brings us to a common ground. And uh, that's, uh, this is the methodology that emerged because of the influence of science and scientific thinking, evidence-based, logic-based. So we felt that we had a chief justice who was extremely well schooled uh, in that methodology, uh, very knowledgeable about the law. I know him for many years. Uh, we both uh, did our uh, doctorates in law at the Harvard Law School. I was a few years ahead of uh, ahead of him, so I know him for many years as an extraordinary scholar of law. And so we had high expectations that he would stick to law. Another judge, I had many, many judges, but one judge that comes to mind in that respect is, for example, Justice Ravindra Bhatt, who, who always sort of is very disciplined about his uh, legal reasoning and his law, very transparent about that, very open about that. And he fully met expectations. Justice Yu uh, Yu Lalit, you know, he ex exceeded expectations. Justice Ravindra Bhatt also exceeded expectations in terms of their rigor and honesty and integrity in sticking to the law. But I think with Justice Chandrachud, there are a few very crucial decisions. Now, by his own admission, that the decision on the on one of the most consequential cases that uh, has come before the Supreme Court, which has uh, shaken this republic to its roots and foundations, uh, was made by him. By uh, uh, made by him, I don't believe it. He, you know, we can't take it literally that it was made by God, but was made by him appealing to God rather than to reason. And uh, that's that, you know, that's so, so naturally expectations have not been met and a number of other issues. He, he, he was chief justice at a time when civil rights are crumbling and uh, innocent people are in jail, you know, for no reason than they, you know, than what they think. And, um, you know, the, uh, you know, uh, India has slipped uh, in the global rankings by one of the most respected institutions, globally independent academic institutions. India has slipped in the last eight years from being an elector electoral democracy to being an electoral autocracy. And, um, uh, and, and so India is no longer a democracy. We may be the mother of democracy, but we are not democracy anymore. The mother is fine. 
uh, you know, but but the child is no longer a democracy. And so much of this happened during the tenure of a few judge, chief justices, including Justice Chandrachur. And I think that's uh, very serious that, you know, the, we have to defend and protect. We cannot yield to arguments uh, of, of the of the of the uh, government, which are not uh, which are plainly plainly uh, you know uh, not above board in terms of motivations targeting selective prosecution you know those who dissent uh, from the government are being selectively prosecuted when uh, they, they switch sides their prosecutions miraculously come to a, a stop and you know the judiciary uh, at the level of the supreme court should not be a mute spectator to 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 all of this and it's not but i don't think i don't think this is a question of a personal failure I think that there are much deeper reasons for this. And I think that's what we need to explore. Every time a chief justice changes, we look at his legacy. Frankly, what can you do? You have just a few months, a few weeks to, to be chief justice of India in a very complex system, one of the world's most complex judicial systems. We need to understand at the systemic level, you know, what's going on. And there, this chief justice is just sort of bobbing on the ocean, right on top in a little boat, on a little boat. And there's nothing he can do to change the undercurrents and the tides and the winds that are pushing the boat in a particular direction. So while I understand the Chief Justice is only part of the system, this CJ in particular was there almost for two years. And yes. when he made that comment on the Ayodhya judgment that he turned to God, he was also very, I believe, very cognizant of the fact that this is going to be discussed, criticized, torn apart, uh, ridiculed or even praised by certain quarters. One question I have about the CGI is, is that he also became visible, right? Like a lot of other CGIs before him were not. Uh, he would speak to the media. He would speak often. Uh, how do you look at that? Did that work in his favor? Did it not? No, I think, um, see, the, the, the point is it's, uh, um, it's, it's really a question of, uh, of, I think, how he's perceived is important to him. How he's perceived is important. He's not someone who... Uh, it, you know, may, may takes a public position without, uh, I, he has not so far taken public positions uh, casually or cursorily. So that means uh, when he spoke out like this, he's, he's not a, an intemperate person. He's not an immature person. So when he spoke publicly, publicly saying that, you know, I, I had to appeal to God to guide me on the decision. He had to look to God and not to reason to make that decision. He was doing so consciously. So he, the question is, who was he appealing to as a person? And now that he is retiring, that doesn't matter because ultimately, as I said, it's a big ocean and so on and very complex. But where the judge is alone is uh, when he's deciding that matter in front of him. Because there, whether you're chief justice or a, a puny judge on the bench, you are sovereign. You're deciding that alone as an individual. So that's where you have the maximum expectation. That how do you understand the world and do you, do you make that decision correctly or not? And there to abdicate, it's like a, a, a surgeon doing a complex brain surgery, stepping out of his operating theater, going into a, uh, you know, into a prayer room and appealing to God and telling me, God, tell me which neuron to, 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 to fix, right? I mean, that's really sudden. It's a, it's a, it's a complete, it, it's a, it's a, it, 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 it's a complete abdication. But he is not a person who abdicates. So he's saying that uh, because he has a reason to say that, a personal reason. He is addressing an audience, and it may not be you and me, but he's addressing an audience. That we can be sure. But there, I, I have no interest in speculating about his personal motives and so on and so forth because it's irrelevant. We, we just have to focus on the decisions that officials make and whether they are right or wrong. And, and if they're wrong for us to be able to, uh, to honestly speak that, because our commitment is to the institution, that we need a strong, independent uh, judiciary. Uh, um, for, uh, every country in the world needs a strong, independent judiciary. Basically, we have a very robust, very strong judicial system with a fantastic um, you know, um, set of achievements, bar, bench. But a few people, it's like Dr. Ambedkar said, if the constitution doesn't work well, it's because those who work the constitution are not good. Not that the constitution is not good. So our question is, those who work the constitution at the highest level, uh, are they really working the constitution rightly or wrongly? The stakes are too high for us to, to just sit in, in an armchair and not speak out about it. When we have a concern that the constitution is not being worked properly, 
we must speak out so that you know constructively positively so that it can be corrected and uh, and the constitution can be worked correctly because every one of us has a stake in the constitution being worked correctly that's what we should focus on but sometimes there are statements which uh, which uh, uh, reach doctrinal stage for example uh, krishnaya writes about the risk of the creamy layer in in a in a judgment so it didn't become precedent it didn't become law but became a very powerful doctrine and the uh, and the judges from privileged caste privileged background still are very worried about this creamy layer and and they're on all many judges and are uh, trying to to uh, to address that issue so um, when when we we speak in public discourse and we take a position we explain the law when we explain the law i think uh, if we say something uh, that is uh, in, you know that that is substantive then it it can rise to the level of being a doctrine and that doctrine can become very influential and so i said uh, i think implicitly not explicitly uh, the, 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 the justice chandrachud has uh, continued the doctrine that the, uh, the, the 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 judiciary and the chief justice must show deference to the uh, to the executive on matters of uh, which are matters which affect the national interest security they must show, show deference and the and the and the rule of law should not be allowed to uh, to uh, to second guess the so uh, the the executive one so there is a, a doctrine of deference which he has continued on important issues on decisions of the collegium there's been deference on security matters there is a deference uh, on uh, freedom of the press there's a deference on on freedom generally on liberty civil rights there is a deference because there is a, a wrong impression being created that that the, the nation is in in danger and uh, the the right wing often does it that the nation is in danger you know the nation is not in danger we are we are actually very solid country with a very good constitution very good uh, traditions cultural traditions uh, active civil society and uh, we are relatively speaking we are basically a strong country the problem is that we have a uh, people working the constitution who want want to use the power for their own in their own interest so yes yeah, so he has i would say that he has uh, contributed to the doctrine of deference which now looking at chief justices for example justice um, lalit justice lodha uh, chief justice like uh, such as that uh, you know in, in, in the old days justice venkra chelaya um, uh, justice jas varma these are people who did not uh, hesitate to to say no the, the role of the judiciary is not deference uh, it is to uphold the rule of law and then together we will we will you know protect the country the rule of law is as important to the country as defending the borders of the country if the rule of law collapses in this country what are we defending what are we defending in these borders if we defend a, a hollow uh, nation the borders of a hollow nation is worthless so the borders must be defended but the rule of law must also be defended equally and they're both important uh, rule of law is also a question of national security civil rights human rights are a matter of national security if you if you uh, f- violate human rights standards you're putting the nation at risk the national security is equally at risk in an out of control police an out of control executive is actually a great threat to the to national security and that's where the supreme court comes in not to balance but to safeguard so i think uh, the uh, the two big issues for the judiciary is whether to have this balancing role or to be a guardian role and they 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 are inconsistent with each other and i think we have seen judges who believe that the supreme court should be a guardian of of civil rights and we can see that for example even in the us in this uh, hamdan case ramsfield versus hamdan case justice john paul stevens uh, says that look i accept the the government's argument that uh, this man is a terrorist is a danger if he's allowed uh, he will cause death and damage he said but he said that is not that does not authorize you to uh, violate the laws of this country or the constitution of this country that risk we have to take that risk and meet that risk not by violating the constitution or the law but within the constitution and the law there was a police head in kerala uh, who actually used to always say that uh, you cannot violate the law to uphold the law to the police because then you are violating the law you have to find the challenges to find a way to uphold the rule of law and protect national security 
And I think uh, that's where I, uh, we all expected that Justice Chandrachud, who understands all this, would be a guardian rather than a balancing, you know, a trapeze artist, right? A balancing on a, on a tightrope. He would be a, 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 a guardian, as Justice D.A. Desai said, that this should be the judiciary uh, should be a guardian on the, a sentinel on the key vive, means a sentinel, a guardian on the alert, protecting the fundamental rights of people. That's what we expect. And um, uh, and the, the not balancing, but protection. So, so um, I want to ask you about the criticism which uh, the CJI, not the CJI in particular, but CJIs have been facing because they are the master of the roster. And this particular term, there has been also criticism that uh, as master of uh, roster, the CJI has not performed well. You did speak about uh, civil liberties and how a lot of uh, uh, political activists are in jail, and it is particularly in this that the criticism has come. Yeah, no, I, I think that that's a very big issue. And um, uh, and I think we need a, 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 a transparent system. I mean, with the judiciary is to protect transparency, but also to practice transparency. You know, you the, the, the physician heal thyself, right? So, um, uh, so we, we need, we need a system which is much more transparent about uh, listing of cases. And uh, master of the roster is, doesn't mean that you can be arbitrary. It's, uh, you know, the Supreme Court is always defending reasonableness uh, against arbitrariness. So no decision of any government official on anything can be arbitrary. So the collegium decisions and, and the on the administrative side, the collegium decisions and the decision on, on, on allocation of cases listing must be, be certainly be made objective, transparent, predictable. And, um, and 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 uh, must be such as to inspire confidence in the public. But ultimately, this roster is becoming an issue because of uh, declining confidence in the methodology of judging in legal reasoning. So, if the Ayodhya judgment was well reasoned, right? It's it's like a uh, you know you you watching a, a story and then suddenly there's an unexpected ending. You you see the story and the history is all building up towards saying something and the result in the judgment is totally the reverse suddenly it's reduced to a, a kind of simple property rights issue when actually it is one of the most most consequential constitutional law issues on secularism what secularism means in this country what the rule of law means in this country can you uh, you know destroy a, a, a structure and then make a claim to, uh, to uh, on that on the structure on that uh, property that you uh, you uh, defaced and destroyed and annihilated so um so i think that the reasoning is where the, the judges must be very strong on reasoning that's not reasoning is not going to make them entirely objective we are all human we make many have a lot of discretion in reasoning but at the minimum uh, you you should have reasoning two doctors may disagree on a diagnosis but they should be able to reason to each other why why am i reaching this and at least both of them must say okay i would not have taken that path but that's a reasonable path to take. I agree with that. It's a, it's, your reasoning is reasonable. But when judges make judgments where the reasoning is not reasonable within the legal community, then it's a, it's a big problem because ultimately the rule of law depends as far as the judiciary is concerned on judges observing unwritten conventions on judicial interpretation. And these are not legislated. These are not in the constitution. And that's about how you reason, right? And those conventions have to be followed. And you cannot reach out into religion and faith to reach a legal conclusion any more than you can do to reach a medical conclusion. So we began this uh, discussion when you said that there were expectations and the expectations were not met, right? So for a, for a normal person in the in, in the Indian public, they would feel that Justice Chandra Chud was someone who the liberal progressive society placed a lot of hopes on. And then the expectations were not met. Can we continue to look at judiciary as that institution which will really uphold our democratic values, or should our expectations now be lowered of the judiciary more and more? See, I think we we maybe uh, uh, focus excessively. It is a very important uh, uh, issue, but we excess uh, focus excessively on judges. I think uh, when we say judiciary, when I say Supreme Court, that includes the bar and the bench. And so, I mean, I've been uh, doing some uh, research and, and I find looking at uh, the court over 75 years, right? You find certain trends are very clear and very strong. 
Now, what is the constant factor? The judges are not there for more than typically three, four, five years, maximum eight, nine years. There's a high turnover of judges. Chief justices are also turning over very, very quickly. So clearly, it, it, you, you know, it's, it's not just about the judges. What is the constant factor in the in the judiciary? The constant factor is the leadership of the bar. They they stay there. They're stable. They're practicing for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. The leaders of the bar at the high court and the, 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 the Supreme Court. And they have a very, very important role to play in shaping the jurisprudence of the court. And I think we have to hold them accountable. There is no diversity. We have to examine for example, why should you have a difference between senior advocates and, and advocates? It's Queen's Counsel and regular lawyers. Why do we keep this? We've got uh, apparently got rid of, we haven't, but, but we have apparently got rid of the colonial impact on our penal laws. At least we are claiming that. Why don't we get rid of this colonialism in the, in, in the bar and then democratize the bar so that we can have a diverse bar? We need more women. We need more uh, people who are not from from caste privileged backgrounds. We need a, the leadership level of the bar. We need much more diversity, and and we need you. You said we expect one chief justice. Yes, he is uh, Justice Chandrachud is a liberal. Is a is definitely un, un, uh, you know uh, we were not uh, wrong to expect from him that he would take liberal positions. He is he th th those are right expectations. He did not meet them, but they are right expectations. But where are the liberals in the bar now? There are a, a small number, a very small dwindling number, but uh, we need to have. Uh, so I think our faith uh, must be on the institution and we need to have more diversity in, in the judiciary. We need more diversity in the bar, uh, regional, gender, uh, social, caste, religious. If you applied uh, uh, Justice, uh, sorry, um, um, Dr. Ambedkar's formula, that uh, we must have representative democracy and all our institutions, judicial, executive, legislature must be representative. If you apply that to the Supreme Court of India, 34 judges, approximately speaking, you would have around eight. These are not quotas, but roughly eight scheduled caste and scheduled tribe judges. You would have 20 non-caste privileged uh, Hindu judges other than scheduled caste, scheduled tribe. Um, you would have five uh, minority judges. right? So that gives you uh, 8 plus uh, 20, 28 plus 5, uh, 33. You, you can have simply to ensure their representation, one judge from a caste privileged background. Now imagine the jurisprudence. Uh, and if you had this in the bar also, imagine, imagine the kind of jurisprudence that would come from a Supreme Court. And imagine that of these people, at least 50% were women, right? In the bar and in the bench, on the bench. And then you'd start to understand that the jurisprudence you, are, you will get is will be very different, which means what we are get, India is ruled by an oligarchy. The jurisprudence that we are getting from the Supreme Court is the jurisprudence of the oligarchy, not the jurisprudence of a representative India. So if we have representative institutions, we'll get a different jurisprudence in which I think the people of this country will undoubtedly have much more confidence because it will re reflect their own life experience and their own expectations. There is now a mismatch between an oligarchic court, bench and bar, bench and bar, and the people who are, who are uh, whose aspirations and, and uh, concerns and, and just demands for justice are simply not able to be understood. If someone like Justice Krishnayar, you cannot find a person whose sincere commitment to liberal liberal values uh, is you know is greater a judge who is greater than Justice Krishna, but he completely got it wrong on reservations, totally wrong on reservations, because he did not have the life experience to understand it. Right. So we need diversity, and we need to then uh, have. Uh, and so the institution is sound, the constitution is sound. There are people out there. There are plenty of people who are very qualified to be. Uh, Supreme Court judges and chief justices who are being excluded simply because they're not part of the social privileged social background, which will get you there. Right. And so we need better ways of uh, making uh, uh, democratizing our judiciary, whether it's a bench or the bar for it to be a guardian of democracy. The judiciary itself has to be democratic. So I'm just going to pick certain phrases from what you said till now, 75 years of the judiciary. Yeah. You said, where are the liberals in the bar and the bench? Yeah. And the diversity is lacking when it comes to the bar and the bench. Yeah. What are the dangers if this goes forward like this without us instituting any change? 
I think it's uh, the the the, the uh, alienation between the state and the people is increasing hugely, and the constitution is meant to bridge that gap so that we don't have a state that is alienated from the people, and the and the people uh, are uh, you know uh, the state is run by the people so that the state becomes an in instrument of the people rather than an in an, a weapon against the people, and the law defends the powerless against the powerful, not the powerful against the powerless. That transition is not taking place, and um, and actually the reservation is about representation. Representation is about ending group inequality in the country. That's so. The problem we are fighting is there are only three or four groups that are powerful, and all other groups are powerless. That's why Article Thirty Eight Two says we we must have equality amongst individuals, but. Article 38.2 says not only amongst individuals, but also amongst groups of people, we must have equality. So we, we have to, we are trying to transition to democracy. Democracy means demos means people, kratos means power. Power must be in the hands of people. That's what we mean by democracy. That's why we are, we have elections, but we are an autocracy, according to this University of Gothenburg, VDEM Institute, variety of democra democ democracy. Institute, which does it has the largest database in the world on uh, on uh, studying democracies, country, political system for two hundred years. Independent public university. Go there, and you'll see that India is now an autocracy and not a democracy, right? So, because power is not in the hands of people. So, I think we need to uh, we un understand that we are in the we are only in the eighth decade of a struggle to transition from an, an monarchy and an autocracy into a democracy. We are, we are only at the beginning of that struggle. The United States had its civil war during the eighth decade of its constitution. We are in the eighth decade of our constitution. This is the stage of the life in the United States when they fought a civil war over the idea of democratization, right? So we are in that stage. So it's, it's not unhealthy. So where are we heading? We want to transition to democracy peacefully, non-violently, through constitutional institutions, not outside. Now, there are a few people, oligarchs, who are preventing the constitutional institutions from becoming instruments of democratization. Uh, they are making the constitutional institutions uh, 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 weapons against democracy. That must end. And they must all agree that we, we have to facilitate this uh, democratization, which is so important that Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes of the United States once said, dramatically, dramatically to make the point. He said, as a judge of the Supreme Court, he said, if the people of the United States want to go to hell, I will help them to do that. That's my job in a democracy, not to, to, to tell them, look, I know better than you. You should not go to hell. Right. So we need that democratic spirit that ultimately it is not a majority is not democrat, a major, uh, democracy is not majoritarianism. It is having every person in India. There is no majority and no minority. We are all minorities, depending on how you slice it. But every person must feel equally valued, must feel equally empowered. And that's what the Supreme Court should, should be a guardian of, the value of the individual, the value of each of us. But so let me interrupt, are the courts being guardians? You said that we must, uh, you know, there must be mechanisms to put a stop to oligarchs trying to take over. Uh, but are the courts acting as guardians to stop that? No, I think there is a strong doctrine in the judiciary that the role of the judiciary is to balance so on reservations, for example, there was a judgment, Nagaraj, where the court said that the a very interesting quote that the, the role of the judiciary is to be is to establish a stable equilibrium, justice for the backwards, equity for the forwards and efficiency for the administration, a stable equilibrium. That's, those are the words of the Supreme Court. Now, equilibrium is actually, if you go to the dictionary, it's a state of stasis. It's a, a, st a state of stagnation where there's no change. So in a country which is trying to make a revolutionary change, uh, you have a judiciary that believes in maintaining stable equilibrium, which is basically blocking that change. When you maintain that stable equilibrium, the status quo continues. What is the status quo? It is an oligarchy. So therefore, the judges are from the oligarchy and they are presenting balance defense of the oligarchy as status quo and balancing. But whereas guarding the rights of the constitution will bring about tremendous change in, the, in uh, and it will bring about democratization. So the guardian role is a role of democratization and change and the stabilizing role, the equilibrium balancing role is one of protecting and preserving the oligarchy. 
So the, the Supreme Court is now not part, neutral on, on this, the, the struggle for democratic change from an oligarchy to a democracy. They are actually openly saying uh, that they will, um, they, will be a, 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 they will protect a stable equilibrium. On reservations, uh, one judgment of the Supreme Court actually said where affirmative action ends, where reverse discrimination begins. These are the words of the Supreme Court. If you discriminate against the oligarchy, we will put a stop to that. You can have affirmative action, but you cannot discriminate against the caste privileged. So where affirmative action ends, where reverse discrimination begins. We are, the, the judiciary has a number of judgments embraced reverse dis discrimination, which is actually clearly seen as a right-wing project in the United States. But reverse discrimination was brought into this country within months of the constitution coming to effect in Champakam Dore Raja, where they, they, they struck down a, a nearly two-decade uh, reservation system, which they could not challenge under the colonial system, using Article 15 and Article 29, uh, on the basis that this discriminates against the Brahmins and that is uh, they didn't use the term reverse discrimination but they were within months days of the constitution coming to effect they picked up the idea of reverse discrimination and said okay you can have affirmative action but where reverse discrimination uh, begins there we will stop affirmative action so how will the supreme court and the judiciary change and become uh, an agent of democratization only if you have a diverse judiciary. Uh, as I said, uh, you know, it must be caste diverse, it must be regional diverse, it must be um, uh, you know, gender diverse, it must be diverse in all sense. People from, uh, you know, from uh, you know, physically disabled background, people who have had the kind of diverse uh, or, uh, you know, special needs, people with special needs, people who, are, who represent the diversity of this amazing country of ours. Right. So that we, and so we must focus on getting representative democracy. Nearly 100 years ago, 95 years ago, in 1930, Dr. Ambedkar told the, told the roundtable conference in so many words, when the British leave, India will be ruled by an oligarchy. And he said the solution is representative democracy. He could not have been more explicit. He brought in reservations only for that purpose, not for poverty upliftment and not for uh, compensating for past discrimination, nothing. He said, we want representative democracy, due and adequate representation of all communities. So we have, we know what the problem is for a century. We know what the solution is, but we need to get on with it. And then all these institutions will change. You were mentioning that in America, it is recognized as a right-wing project that in, there is influence on the judiciary, right? Today, when I see judgments coming in from different, even magistrate courts, uh, high courts, I can see a pattern, but do you feel that conversation has not yet begun seriously in India, that there is a right-wing project within the judiciary, the bar and the bench, when it comes to caste, gender, politics? I think the reality, uh, Dhania, is that there has always been a right-wing project. As I said, from Champakam Dore Rajan, 10 judges, three judges of the Madras High Court and seven judges of the Supreme Court, the entire Supreme Court at that time. In 1950, in the Madras High Court, 1951, in the Supreme Court, within months, days of this constitution coming to effect, you know, no, uh, set aside, uh, uh, you know, equalization. What, would, what did they set aside? A program that had been in place for 20 years to reduce the share of Brahmins who are, who are 2.5% of the population in education, uh, in uh, engineering and medical education from 65% share to 19% share. Now, 19% is still seven times their population share. So that uh, Harij what they co were called Harijans, Dalits, as we would say now, would get, a, a, they were getting no seats in these colleges. And uh, Muslims were getting hardly any three seats by this representation with the Justice Party brought in after they were elected after on the base of the Montague Ch K K Kemsford uh, um, reforms. When the re reservations came in, the Muslims and Dalits started to get some some percentage. And the Brahmin percentage was was reduced from roughly 65 percent to 19 percent for 2.5 percent of the population. Right. That was struck down. Now, if that's not right wing, I don't know what is. So there's no new right wing project. What is happening is that now there is a challenge to that right wing project. There is a backlash to that challenge and the challenge is strong. And therefore, the backlash is getting have, having to coordinate, be more articulate, more desperate, if you will, more assertive. They want to choke off the challenge, uh, you know, and so the challenge is getting visible, visceral. We are saying that, look, we don't care what happens. We are going to speak. 
right? You can do what you want, but we are going to speak, right? Because we want to save, uh, you know, th this republic, which gives us a peaceful way for living together. The only purpose of our republic is that this diverse land can live together in peace with each other and resolve our conflicts in a peaceful constitutional manner. If you're going to wreck that framework for peaceful coexistence, we are going to defend it. Right? So I, I, I th yes, uh, we know, see, actually the name reverse discrimination was used by our, uh, by the United States Supreme Court only 1978 in the Bakke case. But years before that, in Champakan Rajan, without using that name, they applied reverse discrimination. And, and, and now they're openly using it. They're, they're sort of proudly saying, we will not allow reservation to discriminate against the caste privilege. Where uh, reverse discrimination begins, their affirmative action ends. These are the words of the Supreme Court. Not acceptable. Not acceptable. If you're going to defend 65%, if defending 65% of, uh, of, of a share for 2.5% of the, of, the, um, uh, of the population is is reverse discrimination. That's uh, that's an extreme statement that even the most extreme right-wing people would not say anywhere in the world. So one of the dire things that I've heard you saying is that the Hindu Rashtra will be accomplished through the judiciary itself. Yes. Why do you say that? Because it's much simple, easier to do. It's more practical uh, because uh, it, for two reasons. One is uh, the Supreme Court, as, as you know very well, uh, you know, uh, under Article uh, 141 of the Constitution, the law it lays down is um, the law is uh, binding on all the courts of the country. And, and once and if the Supreme Court decides to interpret the Constitution in a particular way, then all of us may say th these are breaking unwritten conventions on judicial interpretation. There is no legal risk. Like the Ayodhya judgment, what can we do about it? Imagine, could the Ayodhya uh, uh, temple have been built based on legislation passed in parliament? Wouldn't it, would have been impossible. Uh, could creamy layer have been imposed on the, ba the basis of uh, legislation in parliament? So should, would subcategorization of schedule cast, imposition of creamy layer on schedule cast, could that have been done through legislation, and, uh, through an amendment to the constitution? Not possible. Therefore, it is what is pragmatic is to use the Supreme Court and to, uh, to, uh, and to interpret the Supreme Court in a way consistent with the core ideas of Hinduism, of, of Ved, let's call it Vedism, it's an ideology. See, caste and religion are not, it's not biology, it's psychology, it's a way of thinking, it's a set of ideas. So those set of ideas that basically believe that in a graded society, in a grade, in a, as Ambedkar said, graded inequality, people are unequal. That kind of idea is already seeded into the constitution. So by the Supreme, by, sorry, into the Supreme Court's interpretation of the constitution not seeded into the constitution, already seeded into the judiciary's interpretation of the constitution. So they can build on, on those interpretations and say that today, see, because they, 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 they will just redefine what is Hindu. We have already halfway there in the Hindutva judgment where they say, look, Hinduism cannot be confined. The word cannot be confined simply to the narrow confines of a religion. It is a way of life. It is a way of, uh, obliterating, it's sort of genocidal, it's a way of obliterating the differences in this country and homogenizing, homogenizing word was not used, but bring, uh, obliterating the differences and building a, a common culture in this country, right? So you've already set the foundation for saying that India is a Hindu state because Hindu means uh, what, what the Supreme Court has already said in the Hindutva judgment. And already we have another judgment uh, in, in the hijab judgment, uh, one of the two judges, Justice Gupta, not Justice Dhulia, has said, Dharma is constitutional law. The Supreme Court has said that. Dharma is constitutional law. We've seen in Davinder Singh, uh, uh, pages of uh, exposition on Varna Shama Dharma, saying Varna is not caste. It is, uh, it is basically a laudable, sensible order. The Supreme Court has said that in a number of judgments. And so uh, all this material is already there. It's just a question of giving that last, you know, icing on the cake and describing, uh, the, you know, uh, f giving a formal interpretation and the, maybe the time will come for that and they're preparing for that. And and um, uh, and so, so more and more judgments are openly, there's a Madras High Court judgment on, on the issue of, uh, of Dayanidhi Stalin's statements against uh, Sanatana Dharma. That judgment is... is Dayanidhi Stalin. 
yes as, as Uday Nidhi, sorry, Uday Nidhi, uh, Stalin, the son, yes. Uh, it, it, that, uh, that, that judgment sets out pages of, uh, it's a constitutional court speaking, describing, explaining, it's, it's, it's setting out uh, Vedist, Brahminist doctrine as the Supreme Court's view, right? Um, when it, it, the legal question was a very narrow one, right? No need to have this exposition. And uh, in, in fact, had initially the judgment had a statement that the caste system is very recent. It, it, it says there was the, the line is that there was no caste system under the Vedic order. It's new and recent. And it, it, that the caste system is only less than a century old or so. But the judgment was corrected. Obviously, some feedback went back and there was a corrected version that is now uploaded, which has deleted that extreme statement that the caste system didn't exist like, you know, before a, a century ago or so. So this is perver. So what I'm saying is, these are theo what I call theocratic judgments, not constitutionalist judgments. Constitutional judgments look to the constitution as the ultimate source of law. Theocratic judgments look to theology as the ultimate source of law. That's been happening for a long time. It's now getting crystallized, and it's getting the support of the executive and the legislature. And so they're all on the same page of um, of understanding India in a very different way. So why would you want to do to attempt the impossible when you just have to put the icing on the cake? So I want to end the interview asking you that you said we're just waiting for the icing on the cake. Things are coming together for the judiciary itself to be that path through which the Hindu Rashtra is obtained. Um, just a very broad question, sir, because I started the interview asking a broad question. What should then the public, those who are those who are cognizant of these things, watch out for, including those in the bar and bench too. Uh, what should we be looking out for and how should we act? Let's go back to Ambedkar. He, he, you know, he, he, he said, look, this is, this, is going, this place is going to be ruled by an oligarchy. Because after the British left, the British left and uh, they are not around. Then the, the Muslims, uh, you know, the majority of them formed another country and left and the elite left. So there's only one social group, the caste privilege group that is left in this country. And so they, they became the oligarchy. So he said that's going to be a problem. And he said, look, the problem is you must insist on representation. So reservation is being blocked by the judiciary. But I think we have to now go, uh, you know, we have to not only safeguard reservation, but we have to demand that institutions must become representative and uh, at scale, at scale. And I think there is no... We are helpless, you know, we are, we are pretty helpless because the oligarchy is at the wheel and they're driving it to a different destination. Uh, the destination reads uh, secular democratic republic, but actually the, the bus has already reached Hindu Rashtra, not just it's a destination, they've reached the destination. Now the question is, how do we pull it back? This VDEM Institute says that, that, that there are that once a, a, a country slips from being a democracy into, in, back into an autocracy or into an autocracy, it's very hard to reverse that. There are very few cases in history where you've been able to reverse that. So you go through a tremendous popular struggle and then you graduate into at least, a, if not a full-scale full scale democracy, an electoral democracy. But once you lose that, to reverse that is going to be a huge struggle. So there are no quick fixes, but the our focus must be on demanding due and adequate representation for all social groups in this country. Because those social groups have a different vision of this country. That vision is democratic, much more democratic, not in all cases, but it is inclusive. It is democratic. It, it, it is not uh, based on, uh, on uh, uh, hatred or is not based on uh, the same theology. So let there be at least uh, a competition of different axiologies in this country, not just one axiology dominating. Let there be a competitive uh, um, uh, process of determining what values. When we say axiology, it's a process of deciding what is valuable and what's not valuable. We have no competition in that. It's only the Vedist, Brahminist axiology that decides what is a value in this country. We have many other axiologies. And all those axiologies come, should come into play at the heart of democracy and we should have a democratic debate about how to determine what is valuable in this country. Is, uh, uh, you know, security uh, at the border, the, it is very important, uncompromisingly important. But is that the only thing that's important? Is, are, are not human rights of the individual, are not civil rights, are not fundamental rights of the poorest person equally important? 
Absolutely. Is, is, are they not equally non-negotiable? Absolutely, yes. So we need those voices also to come in. And so I think we need at all levels to, to, to fight for uh, diversity and 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 uh, of the of the of the country and uh, rather than one uh, uh, you know only one axiology what they mean by one nation is one axiology we must be one nation united but one nation which is a home to a million axiologies that all have value and and have a, a decent civilized uh, democratic debate with each other to determine how value is attributed in an inclusive manner in our country at all levels, we should fight for diversity. That is the, that, those yeah. are the last words of Professor Mohan Gopal. Thank you very much, sir, for joining us. Hope to come back to you for a fresher mm -hmm. conversation um, when something, I guess, uh, happens in the court. But thank you very much for spending uh, this much time uh, with us. Sir. Thank you so much, uh, Dhania, for this opportunity. Thank you.